Okay. Let's turn to the Song of Solomon. Uh, let's put it back in our Bibles this week. That's in the Old Testament, in case you're looking for it. Someplace after the books we normally teach. What I'd like to do this week is, first and foremost, to open up the Scriptures and to say what's in front of us. This is the Word of God. It's as much the Word of God as if you were turning to a passage in Philippians, if you were turning to the Gospels, to in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It's just the Word of God that we have chosen to ignore, to our hurt, to the detriment of our marriages, to the detriment of our Christian homes, to the detriment of our Christian culture. And we've chosen to do so because of our culture. Instead of wanting lives that are ruled by the Word of God, lives which are not only informed by the Word of God, but directed by the Word of God, we've chosen to create a traditional Christianity. A Christianity with roles, with our little ideas of what might be and what ought to be over here. We've chosen to let American culture pervade our Christianity. And then we wonder why we're suffering the same effects in our homes and marriages that the rest of culture. Our rate of divorce as born-again Christians is exactly the same as that of unbelievers. The rate of sexual immorality, the rate of adultery, the rate of sexually transmitted diseases are all the same. It has to do with the fact that the Word of God is what purifies. Jesus said that. Purify them, sanctify them through thy truth. Your word is truth. So we don't take the word of God to these areas of our lives. They're hidden. We're uncomfortable with them. It's written in a way which we are not, uh, to which we are not accustomed. And so therefore, we don't want to learn about it. We want to come to a Bible college and just relearn everything we've learned in Sunday school. Well, it's time to do more than that. And what we want to do is first and foremost, treat this book honestly. I have one method for studying scriptures. Very simple. If you've taken a class with me, uh, you can say it by heart. First, you look at the context. Then you look at the structure. Then you look at the... And after that, you go to application. So what we're going to do is work our way through the book today, looking at context and structure. And then I want to get into some details of the book tomorrow and by Thursday, I really want to get down to application, to where it meets the soul, to where it meets our lives, to where it meets where you are, where those of you are supposed to be who are planning uh, to lead a godly life in this body, in marriage, or by the way, how you should treat things even as a single person. So we'll take a look at this today. I want to talk about two problems to address in terms of context and structure. The first is that this book, in my opinion, is a drama. This book is meant to have different speakers speaking their parts like a play. And if you've ever read a play and then seen a play performed, you know there's all the difference in the world. Because you can't get the opinion of who's speaking and how they're speaking unless you can see that back and forth, unless you can see the, the oomph and the context that's behind it. Especially for many of your Bibles, if it's a traditional Bible, you don't have speakers listed. And if you do have speakers listed, they are simply the opinion of one group of editors. Not even the translators of any version of the Bible listed who they thought the speakers of each of these passages were. There are either five or four or five groups of speakers here. We'll talk about them in a moment. The translators didn't make that decision. If you have speakers listed in your Bible, those were listed by a group of editors, the same people who came along and supplied things like chapter titles and those sorts of things. So what I want to do today is to simply give you my opinion. I'm preaching, okay? So you're getting an opinion, and it's my opinion. You can't give four or five. If I were teaching this, I'd try to give you the breadth of what people think. I'm not. I'm preaching it. So I want you to understand who the speakers are. In order to do that, I'd like to get some speakers up here to do it for you. First, Mr. Boykin and the three men to your left. If you would come up here to my left. 
Komm, komm, komm. These are what are known as dramatist personae, all right? So please, you are, will be, stand next to the president where he can keep an eye on you. Okay. It will be your job to read, as we read through here, that which is highlighted for you. Okay? Uh, yes? Yes? And yes. One, <laughs> all ancient works had what was known as a chorus. A chorus of voices singing out. This chorus happens to be the harem. All right. So <laughs> this is the harem. Now, something I'm going to present to you. A harem is not a good thing. Okay. Kings were not supposed to have them, which we'll talk about in a moment. Second, there is a lover. Okay? There is a male who is the lover. Some say it's Solomon. Some say it is not. I personally don't believe it's Solomon. As we're going to talk about today, my view, Solomon has a very, very, very negative picture painted of him. Please come forward. Okay. So you are reading the part of the male lover. Okay. Great. You're going to have to be loud and forceful, so you're going to stand right up here. And then we need the beautiful Shulamite girl with dark tresses. Did I see Nick Rich? Come on, Nick. <laughs> Notice your parts are... Great. Yeah, right, right. Now, the, the, beautiful, the beautiful and voluptuous Shulamite has been taken from her country home into the palace of Solomon as when there are maids in... Uh, women who worked in the household, and she is being drawn by the ladies of the harem, oh, become part of our harem, and she's trying to decide whether she wants to do that or not. Now, when you read, I have a part underlined, so really read that. So, okay, now you're all going to be reading one after the other, so you've got to follow everybody. Everybody's reading, and just read the parts. Your parts have been highlighted. However, in order to further identify you, First, for the lover. There we go. So we won't forget. For the beautiful and voluptuous. <laughs> and what could better identify a harem girl than the veil? So please put these on. Why, there's one for each of you. <laughs> I would tie them a little higher if I were you, above the ears. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All righty -o. And I will assume the role of the narrator, i.e. getting out of this. All right. Okay. So I'll just read the first part. And then, of course, the second part is the Shulamite. Your parts are all outlined for you. Read them loud. Read them together. <laughs> oh, oh, man. <laughs> you have to understand, Solomon didn't pick them all himself. <laughs> okay. All right. Some of them were kind of, you know, <laughs> gathered from the farther reaches. A few country girls made their ways in, okay? All righty, all. So let me read the introduction, and then we will start over here. Uh, excuse me, with the Shulamite. Let me read the first part. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. 
Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is more delightful than wine. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the virgins love you. Take me away from here. We will will pursue pursue you. (laughs) The king took me into his chambers. We will will be glad glad and rejoice for you. We will will praise your love more than than mine. How right they are to adore you. I am dark, but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem. (laughs) Like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Are you turning to the lover? Tell me whom my soul loves, where you feed your flock, where you make it rest at noon. Why should I be like a veiled woman around the flocks of your companions? If you do not know who pairs among women, follow in the footsteps of the flock and feed your little goats beside the shepherd's tents. I liken you, my love, to a mare harnessed to Pharaoh's chariots, your cheeks covered with ornaments, your neck with braids of gold. Yes, Yes, we will make you ornaments of gold with silver studs. (laughs) (laughs) While the king is at his table, my cachet of spices sends its fragrance. This bundle of myrrh is to me my beloved. It lies all night between my breasts. (laughs) My beloved is to me like a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of Engedi. Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have those eyes. (laughs) Behold, you are handsome, my beloved. Yes, pleasant. Our bed also is green. The beams of our houses are cedar and our rafters of fir. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Like a lily among thorns, so is my love among the dogs. Like a lily among thorns. Okay. All right. Now, here's what's happening. Just so while we got our characters up here. The Shulamite is trying to decide what her future will be with the harem who love where they are. Everything is like, oh, come with us, and it's great to be ornament, ornamented with gold and decked, and we love our veils. And they're all this kind of silly, frothy, and the lover is trying to say, I don't like you like that. You know what you're like? You're just like some horse decked out on a chariot. All that gold and all those ornaments, that's all you are. You're just for show. And then the harem girls say, oh, yeah, ornaments, gold, silver, bling, bling, you know. <laughs> and so it's all what they want, all right? So when you read the play and have it read and see who's speaking, you begin to understand a little bit of the background. Let's give a hand for all of our uh, characters here today. And that back from you. That in there. And you may keep those. uh, I don't think I'll have a use for them. Thank you. (laughs) All righty Just a couple things as we begin. Uh, there are some things that you can teach and there are some things you need to demonstrate. All right. When you're teaching or when you're preaching, you've got to find a way to make your point in a way that's visible to people. When you have a text like this, there are two ways to do it. In my Bible, what I have done is I've actually taken colored pencil and colored in each of the different speakers in a different color. So that when my eye runs down through, I see this speaker in this color and this speaker in this color and this speaker in this color. Since it's so important to understand the perspective of the speaker, I need to see that. Now, I could have had you draw lines in your Bible and write a name next to this one. I've tried that. That works for smaller passages. It doesn't work for larger passages. All right. And actually, this is a book that you really need a Bible that, in somebody's opinion, has at least divided up some of the speakers. Some of it you can tell from the Hebrew. When you have the word you in Hebrew, the word you is always masculine or feminine. So you can tell whether the person being addressed is a man or a woman. It's singular or plural. So some little help is given in the Hebrew But most of it is still the opinion of the person handling the text. But that opinion is something that at some point you need to come to. You can't simply say, oh, this is just too much for me. This is a book of the Bible that God chose to write in a fashion that would require some work for you. 
God could have written it in many other fashions. So when you come to Bible college, one of the things you have to understand is it's not always that you are supposed to let somebody else tell you what to think and what to do. You have to put some work into the Bible. And you've got to understand where it's coming from. The way I believe the book is set forth, the way that I am going to present to you is that there are five groups of characters. There is a chorus of women, the harem. There's a chorus of men. They are the brothers of the Shulamite. There is the Shulamite, who in my opinion is a country girl from the north, who has been taken from her home and brought to the palace of Solomon. We'll talk about that. It's the very thing that Samuel warned the people of Israel would happen. You get a king, he's going to want to take your daughters, and he's going to bring them to his palace, and he's going to bring them for all sorts of things. I believe that she has a lover back home, one to whom she was betrothed, one to whom she was intended, and she has been taken away from that and been brought to the palace. Now she has to make up her mind. Do I live in this palace or do I go back home? And then there's a third character, one who never speaks, one who is only spoken of, one who stands in the background, kind of, that dark figure in the background, and that's Solomon. And I want to present to you, first of all, that when you look at this book, after we look at the evidence, Solomon and the city of Jerusalem are not portrayed as something wonderful and great and just what they should be. They're portrayed as something dark, something that has become out of hand. See, what has happened is that in the lifetime of David, the entire civilization of Israel changed. They went from being rural, from being farmers and shepherds, from having small-town life and elders in each small town and judges And having that sort of situation to, under David, becoming a nation, organized with a powerful army. And then under Solomon, they became urbanized. And I want to tell you, every time a civilization becomes urbanized, it runs into massive trouble. Urbanization pulls all the money and all the jobs to the cities. Pulls every wicked person to the cities. The cities become a very unsafe place to live. Urbanization throughout the third world breaks down family structures. Urbanization breaks down marriages. It breaks down cultures. Urbanization is a powerful force because it makes everything new. It draws the young people to the cities because that's where the glitz and the glitter and the opportunities and the money are. It makes them look back at their homes and the traditions in which they were raised and question them. By the way, that's one reason why many missions, foreign missions, target cities because it's a place where people are questioning all their values and it's a time when they are open more to the gospel. So many missions target it. But for a culture, urbanization is a terrible thing. And so what has happened in Israel is that while you and I look at the reign of Solomon and say, look at all that money and all that wealth and all that city, the people from the north and the people from the countryside said, yeah, Look at all that wealth and all that money and all that urban culture and look what it's doing to us. And they didn't like it. If you read this book in the Hebrew, you'll see that it's written in a different dialect. It's actually written in a northern dialect of Hebrew, not a southern dialect, not a Judean dialect, not the dialect of Solomon, but the dialect of the north. If you know your Bible history, you'll know that Solomon's taxation, how he got all that money, That Solomon's reign was so oppressive that when his son came to the throne, the people from the north showed up at his doorstep and said, we want a new deal. You're ruining our country. Let me just take you through a couple things to point out to you why this is a negative view of Solomon. Deuteronomy chapter 17. Moses, writing to the people of Israel, tells them what a king should do, what a king shouldn't do. Here's what a king ought to do. Here's what a king should not do. Deuteronomy 17, verse 14, I'll read. When you come to the land which the Lord your God is about to give you, possess it, dwell in it, and when you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your brethren you shall set his king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. But look at verse 16 and 17. But he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt 
to multiply horses. Multiplying horses is a bad thing, and especially getting those horses from Egypt. Egyptian horses are a bad thing. Verse 17, neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. He's not to have a harem. He's not to multiply wives because they will turn his heart away. Nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Hmm. Wonder what this is going to say about Solomon. Turn with me quickly, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 10. As Kings, written after the exile, looks back at what happened to the kingdom, 1 Kings chapter 10, several things we could talk about, but let's just turn to verse 14. The weight of the gold that came to Solomon yearly was 666 talents of gold. Gold's price changes every day. Uh, the weight of a talent, um, we're not quite sure of. But this equals somewhere in the neighborhood of $400 million in gold that came. Okay? That kind of money corrupts. That This is a country that 40 years before was a bunch of farmers and a bunch of shepherds. And then you begin to read about everything that he had that was gold through here. He made 600 shields of hammered gold. His guard had to have gold shields. And then it says he made great throne of ivory. And then he puts gold over top of the ivory. And he talks about the, the lions of gold that were around it. And everything that Solomon made, verse 21, his drinking vessels were gold. All the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon. He had a palace that had these big, huge beams that came from Lebanon. Beams so huge they looked like tree trunks. So it was called the forest. Notice verse 26. And Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Each chariot would be pulled by at least two horses and would have two horses in reserve. Okay? Whom he stationed at chariot cities and with the king at Jerusalem. Okay? He made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones, cedar trees as abundant as the sycamores which are in the lowland. Verse 29, now a chariot that was imported from Egypt cost 600 shekels of silver. One chariot, directly in violation of what Moses said a king should be. Now look at chapter 11 and verse 1. But Solomon loved many foreign women as well as the daughter of Pharaoh. Women of the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Edomites and the Sidonians and the Hittites. Verse 3, he had 700 wives and princesses, 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. The harem is not a good thing. The horses are not a good thing. The gold is not a good thing. It's the natural progress of civilization. It brings with it new opportunities, but a boatload of sin. You can't reject the progress of civilization. You can't stand and say, no, I don't want the world to move forward. But you can't be blind to the boatload of sin that it brings along either. And this book, Turn Back to Song of Solomon, is a book that is going to talk about what the nation was like in Solomon's day. A very negative opinion of it. Every time you have an illustration that is about gold, silver, gems, the city, man's workmanship, anything made by the hands of man, it's negative. The positive images are of the gardens, the trees, the animals, agriculture, the simple things, the things God has given, the enjoyment of what God has given. And when you work your way through this book, again, we're just setting this up. Let's take a look at a few of these images and talk about it. Okay. Notice, for instance, um, chapter one, verse nine. I have compared you, my love, that's the lover speaking to her. You know what you're like? You're just like a filly among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks with ornaments, the way the gold harnesses would be on the horses, the gold braided into the, the neck, the way horse's hair is braided. That's all you are to Solomon. You're just one more horse in his stable, and he's got thousands of them. That's all he wants you for. That gold and silver is nothing. All it is is a symbol 
that you're a possession of his. Look with me at chapter 3 and verse 7. Behold, it is Solomon's couch with 60 valiant men around it, all the valiant of Israel. They all hold swords, being expert in war. Every man is armed with his sword on his thigh because of the fear in the night. Just what kind of city is it when the king has to be surrounded by 600 men or 60 men so that he won't be assassinated at night? How well loved is he? How safe is that city? His bed has to be guarded from assassins by people with swords. That is not a pleasant image of the city. Turn with me to chapter 3. There are two dream sequences in the book where she's dreaming. It says in verse, chapter 5, excuse me, verse 2, I sleep, but my heart is awake. In other words, I'm sleeping, but my mind is thinking. It's a dream sequence. And notice what happens in verse 7. She's seeking her lover. She can't find him. The watchmen who went about the city found me. They struck me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls tore my veil away from me. These are the guards that are supposed to protect people. And they prey on the women that they find alone in the streets. That's not a pleasant image. That's not an image of a wonderful place for a woman to be. That's not an image of this beautiful, glorious, golden city of Zion. Take a look at chapter 6 and verse 8. Again, I believe it's the lover speaking. There are 60 queens and 80 concubines, virgins without number, like her. All these young women brought in to be servants and sweepers up and to work around the palace, just like Los Angeles attracts all the beautiful girls. That was Jerusalem. That, that city is filled with those kinds of people. But he says, but my dove, my perfect one, my only one, the only one of her mother, the favorite of the one who saw her. She's my, I only have one. I'm not like Solomon. I just have one. The daughters saw her. They called her blessed. The queens and the concubines praised her. Notice the same thing in chapter 8 as he ends the book. Verse 11 and 12. All the way through, the vineyards and the gardens are compared to the woman, her person, herself, her body, okay? All the way through, that's what vineyards and gardens are compared to. We read in verse 11, Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Hamon. He leased the vineyards to keepers. Every one was to bring for its fruit a thousand silver coins. That's his harem. He has thousands of keepers, thousands of eunuchs to watch all of these women and to guard all of these women. Verse 12, my own vineyard is in front of me. You, O Solomon, may have a thousand, and those who tend its fruit, two hundred, but my own vineyard is mine. The lover speaks to Solomon and says, you may have a thousand women, but I have one. When you read this book, it's a powerful indictment of what happens when you allow your vision of what God has made a woman and a man to be and what God has made marriage to be corrupted by the culture around you. And no culture on the history of the earth has corrupted the world like America has and like America is. So we'll talk about that. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we praise you for your word. I'd ask that you might teach us to study it. I'd ask, us, I'd ask you that it might not just be another book to us. It might not be someone else's book, but it might be our own. We might learn from it. That we might take the time to study it that our hearts would be changed by the truth of it. And what we are and what we say and what we do is only because of Jesus Christ, who's come to live within us and to make us love the word which is his. And it's his precious name that we pray. Amen. Let's return to the book, the Song of Solomon. Maybe uh, in transition to begin, uh, Part of what this series is about is making our language of love biblical again, is returning to a Bible-based view of human sexuality, of marriage, and more importantly, what I've been trying to emphasize is how that develops and the influence of our culture upon the development of our views and our human sexuality. I really believe that what's happened in the church is that most of what we have and most of what we see 
in terms of the speaking and thinking about sexuality is what in the early church would have been called Gnosticism. Gnosticism um, is a kind of a complicated philosophy, but the end result were two opposite, extreme, unbiblical, heretical views of pleasure. On the one side, there were those who said, you know what, this body is evil. This world is evil. Anything you can touch, anything you can sense is evil. And therefore, to be righteous, we've got to get rid of anything sensual. We're not to enjoy or to take pleasure in anything. That worshiping God in part consists of what they considered mortifying the flesh, which is simply denying any pleasure. You do not marry. You do not eat certain foods. You starve yourself. You become an aesthetic. And that therefore, what they have done, according to Paul, is they've denied their Creator, who gave these things to be enjoyed when they're received with thanksgiving. And Paul condemned that. And yet, frankly, I think that's the approach of many evangelical Christians today towards sexuality. Just repress it. Just deny it. Just take all of those desires and lump them in the category of lust and push them down and suppress them and get this hard outer shell of rules and of a lifestyle and keep everything suppressed inside. That has produced some of the most warped, some of the most perverted views of marriage and sexuality, and you cannot suppress natural desires. They break out someplace and they destroy you. They, it's, it's just horrible to see how that works and that that goes under the name of Christianity. One side of Gnosticism so prevalent. Then there's the other side. The side of the Gnostics said, you know what? The flesh is evil, but the spirit is good. And they never touch one another. So why not use the flesh for the flesh? Meats for the belly and the belly for meats. Paul isn't saying that's a principle. He's quoting a Gnostic lie, as Paul does two or three times in Corinthians. Paul, all things are lawful to me. That's not a Christian statement. Paul's quoting a Gnostic statement and saying, but I'm saying something completely different to you. Paul says, it's not true that you're just made for this world. Those people were called libertines who said, just do it. It's just natural. Live what you want to live because being spiritual is not a matter of the body. It's really a matter of the spirit. So your body can do whatever it wants. That's sick as well. There's a whole lot of that running around Christianity. A whole lot of the idea of, well, what's wrong with it? Why can't I do it? Let me just live this carousing, partying lifestyle. And then I'll cavil and quibble about, well, it's really not this. And it's really not that. But what it's really not is Christ honoring. And we know that and we see that. The truth is always balanced down the middle and avoiding the extremes. The truth is always hard to walk in. It's always hard to maintain. It requires the study of the Word of God, not pulling a verse from here and there, not letting the culture drive you and not running from the culture. If you're running from the culture, it's driving you as much as if you're following the culture. It's finding the path of beauty, what God created. This creation is meant to drive you to your Creator. The desires and appetites God put inside of you were meant to drive you to your Creator. And that's what this book is about. Chapter 1, what I want to do. Yesterday we talked a lot about the context and some about the structure of the drama. Today I want to talk more about the structure and talk about one of the emphases of this book is the Shulamite. You begin and end with her. And the book follows her growth and her development. And one of the, the best ways to study a book like this is to watch how characters change. And what we find is the Shulamite character, as we open up the book, is a young girl who's torn and she's troubled. She's torn because she finds herself in the palace of the king. She finds herself under the influence of that harem, sometimes called the daughters of Jerusalem, who are a very worldly influence on her, which I want to show you today. And she's torn because she's come from the countryside. She has that lover. 
but she's in this society now, this civilization in the palace that is so attractive and so appealing, so powerful, so wealthy, so sweeping you off your feet. It looks so good. I'm just amazed at the power, for instance, that magazines have on teenagers. We show them these images of pen, pencil-thin women who only look good under certain light with certain pictures, who've got bone structure that looks really great when you paint it just right. And we put them in these elegant gowns that no one could possibly afford and put them in these elegant sceneries. And young girls read these and think, that's how I ought to dress. That's what men like. That's what the world wants. How much of our self-image is dominated by marketing? Somebody wants to make money off of you. So they give you their picture of beauty so that you'll run after it, buy their products, and they'll laugh all the way to the bank. While your life just spirals out of control because you've got to have that weight and that look and that dress and that lifestyle and that attractiveness. Well, that's what's facing this Shulamite in her day and age. That's what's represented by the girls of the harem. They live in this protected environment where all they have to do is walk around and be an ornament. And they love the ornaments. And she's torn. One of the fascinating things in this book is that she begins, though, with that statement about her image of herself, which Nick read so richly yesterday. Okay, uh, verse 5. I am dark but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem. She's arguing with and continually in her speech, notice how she's trying to defend herself or withstand these daughters of Jerusalem that are the influence, the bad influence on her. Like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not look upon me because I am dark, because the sun has made me dark. It's always in every society. The rich people you can tell because they don't work. They're the ones with the soft hands. In most societies, the rich people are the lighter-skinned people because they get to work inside. In American society, the rich, get, the rich people are the ones with tans because they don't have to work inside. You know, and it's this status kind of symbol. And that I've, I can, don't look upon me for that. Then she starts out with this, oh, I don't know how to put it, this sense of, of shame, this sense of I, I don't measure up and I'm not where you ladies are. They've been kept inside the harem with the white skin and the parasols and whatever to keep them that way. And she, she's, done, she's not confident in who she is. And she's torn because she's presented this picture of beauty that's in the palace contrasted the picture of beauty that's on the countryside. And I challenge you to read through this book again tonight and see that every single time there is a negative image, it has something to do with things that are man-made with the city, with gold, with jewels, jewels that have to be cut, gems to be beautiful. When you take a rough gem, when you take a rough diamond or a rough ruby, it's kind of red. It has to be cut and refined to be beautiful. When you take gold, gold out in a rock isn't very beautiful. It's got to be man has to deal with it and refine it to make it sparkle. It's interesting, and if you read uh, the law... When an altar was made to God, you always had to make it out of rough stones. You could never make it out of cut stones. Exodus chapter 20 says, never make an altar out of me out of cut stones. Make it out of rough stones. Don't want man's carefully chiseling off the edges and putting it all together after man's form of beauty. And every image in here that's negative is an image of what appeals to man's senses, of gold, of, of those things that are man-made. And every image that's positive is natural. It's about the garden. It's about the animals. It's about the trees. It's about the beauty of nature. All of those things are positive. Again, this goes back to the urbanization that was happening in the land. And how it was really ruining, and here's the term I want you to get today, the simplicity of the people. True beauty is always found in simplicity. That simplicity is simply being open before God, being straight before God. It says in the book of Romans, be simple towards evil. This world wants you to be sophisticated. 
know what you're supposed to do, know how to manipulate, know how everything works together, know how to get your way. True beauty is in simplicity. Sometimes that's naivete. It's innocence. It's a sense of, I don't know the pleasures of love. I only dream about them. But I want them. And it's proper for me to want them because I'm naive and I'm innocent about them. So my longing is proper. But it's when I've experimented with those pleasures before God's time. It's when I've pulled myself in and allowed myself to be allured by the world grabbing me and saying, this is what pleasure is. This is what sex is. That's eroticism. And it will ruin your life. The more time you spend allowing the world to distract you and to pull you into their concept of beauty, the more difficult it will be for you to enjoy an intimate relationship in the beauty of one person. God designed for you to enjoy love and beauty with one person on this planet. And guys, the more time you spend casting your eyes at pornography, the harder it will be. You are corrupting the edges of your mind and it will be more and more difficult for you to enjoy that intimacy with one person. You're losing something, that innocence and that simplicity that is so hard to regain. And this young girl is torn back and forth. And by the way, that's why all these dream sequences. Let's just talk about two of them here. Chapter 3. By night on my bed I sought the one I love. She's dreaming. And your dreams always indicate what's bothering you and how you're torn. Again, in chapter 5, in verse 2, we mentioned, I sleep but my heart is awake. She's torn between that which inside of her, that which she's come from, that which she knows to be right, the simple attraction of the one who loves her. That's what we mean by her lover. Not the one whom she loves, but the one who loves her, which we'll talk about tomorrow. And by this plastic, artificial voice of the harem. Let's look at them for a moment as well. Come back. Let's, I want you just to see their voices. She talks about where she is in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 1. Okay? And then she says in verse 4, Draw me away. Get me out of here. I don't want to be here. Then what do the daughters of Jerusalem say? We'll run after you. We'll pursue you. We'll bring you back. They're going to suck her right back in. She didn't really have much of a choice about it. So she's being drawn in and you begin to see their influence. And they're trying to say, stay here. Everything's just fine. It's just great. Learn to love your captivity, if you will. Notice, the king took me into his chambers. Then the daughters of Jerusalem, that, isn't that just wonderful? It's the greatest thing. We will be glad and rejoice with you. We will remember your love more than wine. Look what happens later on when her thoughts turn to her beloved. When she starts to talk to them about her lover in verse 7. Tell me, O oh, you whom I love, where you feed your flock. Where is it that you make it rest at noon? For why should I be like one who veils herself, i.e. these harem girls, and by the flocks of your companions? Her thoughts are going out to where he is. Why should I be like them? Now notice their sarcastic reply in verse 8. If you do not know, O oh, fairest among women, follow in the footsteps of the flock and, flee and feed your little goats beside the shepherd's tent. Go run after your little goat boy, you know. Go run after that lover if that's what you want. Then he speaks. All you are is an ornament. All you are is a possession. Uh, you're just like a horse, one of the many horses that, that Solomon has decked out in the Egyptian fashion with gold. You're like those, you ever seen those Clydesdales? The big headdresses and like, that's all you are that they trot out for show. And then the daughters of Jerusalem in verse 11 speak up. Oh, isn't that good? Yeah, ornaments. Yeah, we love it. Jewelry, you know. We will make you ornaments of gold and studs of silver. These daughters of Jerusalem are constantly exerting this negative influence on her. And I want you to see what she says to them. Three times in this book, 
she addresses them with the same phrase. First, we begin in chapter 3 and verse 5. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field. Again, she's using the agricultural imagery. She's thinking about nature, how God made things to be. Do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. She's learning a lesson. Appetites are God-given. Your desires are God-given. When they're in the right place and the right time, directed towards the right person for God's ends, then they're wonderful. But the wrong place and the wrong time, directed towards the wrong person, For the wrong ends, their sin. In the Greek, it's the same word for godly desires and for lusts. It's the same word for trials and temptations. Same word. The the same thing in a different circumstance can either be good or can be evil. It's supposed to be in the right place. Don't stir it up. I don't want to let my culture stir things up inside of me until it's the wrong time. I want things to develop at the pace that they're supposed to develop. Nothing is sicker than to see little children being moved in the direction of looking and acting like adults. Dressing up little children as if they're models and dressing them up sensuously and putting them in beauty contests and trotting them out there as if they're a 20-year-old woman when they're a 4-year-old girl. It's not the right time and it's not the right place. We're stirring up desires that need to grow naturally. God has put into animals a natural cycle of desire. A natural cycle of when time stirs and when things are right inside of them. And in its right time, it's the most wonderful thing in the world. But if you stir it up when you're not supposed to. And she talks to the daughters of Jerusalem and says, don't do this. See if I can find the next place where this is. I think it's in uh, chapter 6. See, if I've written it down here someplace where she talks to them. Um, Maybe it's chapter 3, verse 5, chapter 2, verse 7. Oh, there we go. I missed one of them. It was earlier in chapter 2 and verse 7. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. And the last one is at the end of the book in chapter 8 and verse 4. Same thing. She's saying to these women, in essence to her culture, don't stir up things that shouldn't be stirred up. I don't want to be aroused in that direction. I don't want my mind set on the wrong thing. You know, you're living in a world that wants to capture your attention because as soon as it's got your eyes, your heart will follow. Where your eyes and your head go, that's where your body goes. You want to make a basket? Better get your shoulders facing the basket. You can showboat it and make these shots like that, but if you want to make a basket, you better get your shoulders and hopefully your hips facing the basket. You know how you get them? You get your head the right direction. First your head, then your body, then the direction it follows. It's called attitude. The world knows it. If it can get your eyes in that direction, you'll turn and you'll go there. My wife does not always care for the way I drive. Okay? She tends to be skeptical as does the person riding in what's euphemistically known as the death seat, you know, as you drive. Because I'll be driving down the road and I'll go, would you look at that? And she'll say, no, would you look at that? Because I'm like, all of a sudden the car is kind of drifting. Oh, I'm I'm sorry, where was I here? Oh, look at, oh, where where my head goes, the car goes in the opposite direction. It's kind of like I'm compensating, you know, going back and forth like, you know, the the prince of the bounding mane as I'm driving, you know. My poor wife is... (gasps) Where your eyes go. The other factor, though, is how do people look at you? How do you allow people to look at you? How do you want to be seen? For young women, so much of their life and their decision is what people think of them. It's interesting. It's not that way so much for men. But for young women, it's amazing how much they... What are people going to think? How am I being looked at? How am I being seen? Women live in a different world than men live in. It's a different reality for them. 
And it's so fascinating through this book to see the battle for how she is going to be seen. Best example of this is in chapter 6. I want you to see, we'll start in verse 11, just work our way through this, that here is the turning point in the battle for her heart. She's been going back and forth. She's had these two dream sequences where she's torn. I'm looking for my lover, but I'm pulled back into the city. I always run into these guards. I run into these walls. Okay, Chapter 6, verse 11. I went down to the garden of hazelnuts to see the greenness of the valley, to see if the vine had budded and the pomegranates had bloomed. Is it the right time? Should I be married? Should I be wed? Is it the right time for that? She's thinking about that, and she's thinking about it in the right way. Then verse 12. Before I was even aware, my soul had pulled me like the chariots of my noble people. Before I knew it, my mind was turned. I think that phrase, the chariots of Aminadab, is a song. I think that this is one of the two or three places in the Bible where you're about to be introduced to a tune, to a song. Because what follows next is fascinating. She is now going to be pictured as a dancing girl, as a, as you would say, a belly dancer or a harem dancer. That's the next scene that's in front of there. Her mind is pulled back to the harem. Notice verse 13. The, this is, in my opinion, this is the women of the harem speaking. Return, return, O Shulamite. Return, let us look on you. Let us see this part of you. Let us determine who you are. Think of yourself in this way. Let us look at you this way. Then her lover speaks. What would you see in the Shulamite? Like she's a dancing girl. The dancer of the two camps. Like she's one of these dancing girls. That's all you see in her. You don't see real beauty. You don't see natural beauty. You don't see God-made beauty. You see her like some bejeweled, bedecked dancing girl. Notice how the description begins. How beautiful are your feet? She's a dancer, so the description starts off with the feet. And everything in chapter 7, verse 1, working all the way down to verse 5, Everything here has to do with man-made things. Sandals, gold, goblets, cups. Every description there is like that belly dancer and all the jewels and the bangles that are going on. He says, that's how you see her. That's what she really is if you really looked at her. Paul talks in Timothy and he says, listen, you women. Just as the men have to demonstrate an awareness of submission, they're to be in submission to those who are over them, so you. But for you, you've got to demonstrate a beauty that doesn't come from outward adornment, the the way you put up your hair and the jewels that you wear, but it's got to come from something inside of you, from a poised and quiet spirit. And he points out all of these things that he talks about, like a prince's daughter. The curve of your thighs are like jewels, the work of the hands of a skilled craftsman. Your navel is like a rounded goblet. Hmm, how how attractive is that? It lacks no blended beverage, which the Bible always condemned. Always condemned the idea of mixing the different wines to make them more potent. Okay? It's... All of these things, he's describing her like a dancing girl until you come down to verse 6. If you're following this in the Hebrew, you'll notice that chapter 7, verse 1 begins with the word ma, how beautiful, ma yafit. This is the description of negative things, of the dancing girl. Then in verse 6, it's ma yafa, it's his description of her. And it's a very graphic description. Okay, it's a description that's far too graphic for our language, so I'll read it for you. How fair and how pleasant you are, O love, with your delights. The stature of yours is like a palm tree and your breasts like its clusters. I said I will go up the palm tree, I'll take hold of its branches. Guys, I wouldn't be writing this in a note to girls, okay? So this isn't the kind of thing that you'll be arrested for stalking, you know, if you put this in here, okay? Now let your breast be like clusters of the vine, the fragrance of your breath like apples, the roof of your mouth like the best wine. See what's happening? 
he's now describing her. The language is just as passionate and just as powerful, but it's natural. God has put within you natural passions, not to be denied and repressed and suppressed and diverted, but to be directed, understood, expressed at the right place and the right time towards the right person. I I just can't describe to you what it's like to have that intimate relationship with one person. If you knew what that was like, you would you would be terrified of ruining your opportunity for that by messing around with other people. You'd say, I want that intimacy for with one person. When you're married, when you're at some formal get-together, you're in one place talking, your wife is in another, and the two of you look up and your eyes meet, and something stirs inside of you, and it's like, time to go. You know, <laughs> party's over, you know. It's... <laughs> Let's blow this popcorn stand, daddy Oh, you know. It's there. He knows. <laughs> right? By the way, okay, uh, let me show you something about this. Look at chapter 8 and verse 5. Let me bring in another element here. Look at chapter, I believe, if you draw a line between chapter 4, chapter 8, verse 4, and verse 5, this is one of the great turning points. This is the point at which she goes to the wilderness and is married to her beloved. Now she's coming back. After the honeymoon, as it were, she's coming back. Notice what it says. Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? I awakened you under the apple tree. There your mother brought you forth. She who bore you brought you forth. In our society, as soon as you talk about sexuality, the first thing that leaves the picture is your parents. In our society, that's like, ugh, ah, who can think of that? That's sick. God has made it so that you should have in your godly home A development of genuine sensuality. You should see it reflected in your parents. You should see in them a growing love and intimacy. We've turned sex into something that's about the young and the beautiful. Not about something that's a growing intimacy. You were meant to see these examples. You were meant to have the influence of your parents. And we've taken that right out of the picture. We have now, by the way, I'm almost ashamed, the only time that parents enter into the picture is sometimes with this Gnostic idea of the repression of all sex. Absolute repression. Just deny it until the day you're married. Can't do that. Body doesn't work that way. The mind doesn't work that way. God doesn't work that way. But it ought to be the parents who demonstrate what that genuine intimacy is. It ought to be that sense that you see it in them. You see what it's like to have that genuine relationship. You want that developed. That it's not your peers and the world, the harem that's developing your idea of who you are, what's beautiful about you. If you want to know what's beautiful about you, listen to the people who love you, not the people you love. Listen to the people who love you, not the people you're attracted to. If you're going to those things that you want, To determine what's attractive about you. I want to look like this person. I want to date this person. I want to be like these people. And therefore that determines your self-image. You will be a troubled and torn and disturbed person your whole life. Get your sense of beauty from people who love you. From your parents. From that one person one day who will be your lover. It is the greatest privilege and responsibility of a lover... To build in the beloved a sense of who they are and their beauty. That's what Jesus Christ does for you and I. He gives us a sense of who we are in Him and who we can be. Notice how the book ends up. Notice what she says about her beauty. She's got her brothers in verse 8 who never give her her due. We have a little sister. She has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister in the day she's spoken for? She's so homely and ugly, who wants her? She's a wall, i.e., she's flat-chested. 
We will build on her a battlement of silver. She's a door. We will enclose her with boards of cedar. We can dress her up and somebody will want her, you know, paint up the barn and somebody will buy it. That's their idea. Look at her answer in verse 10. A question. I am a wall. My breasts were like towers. I became in his eyes as one who had found peace. She said, you know what? I see what he sees in me. I, it's all that matters. He sees me as beautiful. That one whom I love. That one who loves me. Go for your image to people who genuinely love you. And tomorrow we're going to talk about what it means to be a lover and to build into a person a sense of who they are, of the rightness of who they are, of loving them for who they are, and building up in them what, they, what should be built up in. Love edifies. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Let's pray. Father, I, I don't know how we get where we get. How easy it is for uh, even the most natural and wonderful and beautiful things to get perverted. Not only by this world, but by false Christianity. I'd ask, Father, that you might turn our hearts through your scriptures. That you might make us think biblically. That you might make us look at ourselves and our world the way you look at it. What you've created it to be. That we might worship our creator because of what he has made us. Not the creation but see our Creator through what He has created. And we're going to love you. We're going to live for you. And we're going to show a world what you're like because of it. In Jesus' name we ask this. Don't worry, I'll end on time. You can tell what that means to everybody. Turn with me to the book of uh, Song of Solomon. We'll return here. By the way, I do believe in ending on time. Uh, we're sending many of you out there to be preachers. Um, it's good to remember that um, there are many parts to every service. If you're pastoring a church and you're preaching, uh, there may be people in the auditorium, but there are people back there working in the nursery, and there are people working in children's church. And um, having an idea for where you are and doing all things in their right time is not only good for Song of Solomon, it's good for preaching as well. So uh, what I want to do today as we conclude the book and conclude the series is try to bring some things together as this couple comes together. I believe that in uh, chapter 8 and uh, between verses 3 and 5, is when you actually have the consummation of the marriage. By the way, uh, there's a lot of possibilities for application of this in spiritual realms. Uh, I think we, we shy away from that. I know I do because that is all I heard growing up. The Song of Solomon was one long extended spiritual metaphor for Christ and the church, even though the church was a mystery in the Old Testament, this was one, and actually it was a mystery to me how it got in there, but it was sort of a, it was all spiritualization. On the other hand, you have to realize that God hasn't given you any relationships here on earth that are not meant to deepen, to further, and to direct your attention to your relationship with Christ. And that your relationship with that one person who complements you, who completes you, who finishes you in a human sense, your help me, your relationship with that person is not just an echo of your relationship with Christ. It's meant to deepen it. It's meant to cause you to, to grow in that area. And as we ended up yesterday, I think that often we make a great mistake in that we have separated the family from our thoughts of ourselves as sexual beings that we've taken out that element that God designed to be there, that your family is supposed to be a place where you grow and develop into the person you're going to be, and that whether you do it by design, by accident, or by sinfulness, you learn about who you are from and through your home. And that in this passage, we see that emphasis over and over again. I want to come to verse 9 of chapter 7 where I'll start today. Remember we said that um, she's being torn throughout this book 
back and forth between those daughters of Jerusalem, the harem, who represent the, the worldly influences, and her beloved, who is growing better and better in his attempts to, to speak to her heart, is the biblical expression, um, to win her, to uh, let her know who she is in his eyes. And when he makes his last statement about who she is in verses 6 through 9, contrasting with the harem girl that they want to make her, notice what it says at the end of verse 9. The wine goes down smoothly for my beloved, moving gently the lips of sleepers. That's the woman speaking because she's talking about the male, the masculine word beloved here. Then she said, I am my beloved and his desire is towards me. At this point, here is where we're coming to. The Bible speaks that there is a holy, genuinely biblical desire that a man has for a woman. That's not something ethereal. That's not something abstract. That's not something like, well, I have this list and that's what the person must be. That's not something that can be uh, you know, disassociated from the appetites of yourself. There's a genuine desire that God gives for one person. And it's important for that other person to know you have it. It's important in a biblical relationship for the husband to know that his wife desires him and for the wife to know that the husband desires her. It's just a terrible thing when you look out on a church congregation and you see how many couples have either lost that desire or give every evidence that they've lost that desire. And it's even worse when you see families, children growing up in homes where there's no evidence of the desire of the father and mother for one another. Where everything else constitutes family life, but that basis of the mutual attraction of the father and the mother towards one another. And in this passage, it's fascinating. Look at chapter 8, how the family and family metaphors are mixed with the desire of the man for the woman in a way that we would never do in our society. Chapter 8 and verse 1. Oh, that you were like my brother who nursed at my mother's breast. If I should find you outside, I would kiss you and would not be despised for it. I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother. She who used to instruct me, I would cause you to drink of spice wine of the juice of my pomegranate. It's a fascinating thing to them that sensuality was part of what they learned in the home. We've chosen every other venue for learning about sensuality and talking about it but the home. Turn on your TV, turn on your radio, open up a magazine, listen to the conversation of people. You're just surrounded with people trying to define what sensuality ought to be. We're even afraid to use the term. I know I want to qualify it every time I say it because the world has so corrupted it. But you are supposed to learn about it in your home. And you are supposed to teach your children about it. Reproduction does not simply mean that you bring children into the world. It means that you will reproduce in those children all that is formative in their life, including their their concept of who they are as a person and who they are as a sexual being, whether you know it or not. You're either doing it by design, by happenstance, or by mistake. But you're producing that in your children. And your parents have produced something in you. Your parents are sinners. They made you to be a sinner. Okay? You were conceived in sin. You were made and your nature is that of a sinner. And yet at the same time, they have the responsibility for forming you and saying, yes, but this is what it means to be a creature of God. This is what it means to be what God has given you. And we don't want to hear that. We don't want to think about our parents and sensuality. We don't want to think about learning from our parents. We learn from so many different places. And when preachers try to teach us, it gets so warped. Uh, Maybe your generation has escaped some of that. But if you grew up in the 60s and the 70s, you know what I'm talking about. Every year at camp, they brought in the guest speakers, usually from a well-known southern university, and they would come in from this place and they were going to preach sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I don't care if they were preaching Genesis 3, Romans 4, the Gospel of John, or Revelation. It was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And it was those three and you knew you were going to get it. You just knew it was coming. 
Ken and I can share stories of the mutual camp that we shared for many years and our experiences there, but we kept bringing this one evangelistic duo down and they kept doing it to us every summer, leaving the pastor shaking their heads saying, what have we done again? And I remember that the last year we had them, the, the preacher of the duo preached a message that he entitled, The Hottest Sermon Known to Mortal Man. Okay? What he did in that sermon was that after preaching on the lust of the flesh, you know, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, okay, after he read that verse, he then wanted to show us that rock and roll music was the source of all of this. So, he had the middle of his message devoted to 20 lyrics from rock and roll music that were explicitly sexual. And he read them in the middle of the service. By the way, this is junior camp. Okay. <laughs> Fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth graders are there. Okay? So he's going on and on and on. One of the pastor's wife gets up and leaves. Oh, you know. It's like, oh, we'll counsel her later. Let me, you know, stay and find out what, what damage control I've got to do. And it's getting hotter and hotter. And every time he preaches, it just scared me because he'd say lust and his voice would drop like two octaves. The lust of the flesh. Ooh, yeah. Okay, what's wrong with this picture? Okay. Little did I remember that that was junior camp and that week I had brought my son who's in first grade so he could be with his brother who is older brother. So he came with me. I was one of the, the men helping to run the camp that week. So my little first grader's down there taking notes in his little first grade hand, right? I, so he shows them to me afterwards and the little like, you know, the big old t- pencils that they write with L-U-S-T. Kind of like the speaker said it. Rust, you know. He had it all written. And on the way home, he asks me, Dad, what's lust? Now, this is two nights after the message is preached. It's stuck in his tiny little brain. What is lust, you know? And I got a whole car full of teenagers waiting to hear this explanation. So, so I'm a big believer that you should teach your children about things at home. I'm also a big believer that they shouldn't learn about sin too early. That It's one thing to teach them the positive aspects, but I don't think children need to know about what lust is. Not in first, second, third, fourth, and fifth grade. They'll find out about it. I think they need the positive before they got the negative. So I told him it was how the Japanese call rust. You know, <laughs> it's a Japanese word for rust, you know. They, everybody in the back, and like my son, oh, he's writing it down. Uh, his dating life has never been quite the same, you know. <laughs> Took his girlfriend to Ace Hardware, you know. <laughs> Something in my mind can't get out of that picture. But every time I think about this passage, I go back to that camp and these men of God spreading, I don't know what best word to use for it, deception, and, and trying to preach against sin in a sinful way, by creating an image that is not biblical. And our answer is it needs to be reproduced in the home. We need to be teaching a biblical model. You need to be entering into marriage with that model. And it's a fascinatingly balanced model here of openness and intimacy. Openness in these verses. I'll read them one more time. Oh, that you were like my brother who nursed at my mother's breast. If I would find you outside, I would kiss you and not be despised. I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother. By the way, that's always a biblical expression for where the woman lived who was marriageable. If she was said to be in the house of her father, she was not able to be married. It's a key to many stories that when Samson's wife returns to the house of her father, he assumes she won't be married off to some other person. That when Tamar is told to go back to the house of her father, that's Judah saying, you can't be married. And that these expressions, the house of my mother is a place where the the woman is and she's of marriageable age and she's thinking about marriage. Just the openness of this speech isn't something that we do. But notice the intimacy in verse 5 and 6. Who is this coming from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? 
I awakened you under the apple tree. Notice it says up in verse 4, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, don't stir up or awaken love until it pleases. This is after the marriage night. I awakened you under the apple tree. There your mother brought you forth. There she who bore you brought you forth. That wilderness is that picture of intimacy where they're all alone and all by themselves. You see, God has created this balance where within the bounds of your family, within the bounds of those who love you, within the bounds of where you can see the picture of it acted out, you're supposed to get that positive, I don't know what better word to use than wholesome, sound, healthy picture of what a man and women are supposed to be. But it's only acted out in privacy, in intimacy. True intimacy requires privacy. It's not something that's public. It's not something that anyone else knows about. It's not something that anyone else, they they know about it, but they don't know about it. It's just the two of you. And that beauty that you bring into it of saying it's only you and I and there's never been anyone else and there never will be anyone else. When you can have that relationship with someone, there's just something so perfect and right about that. I just can't describe it to you. It's so natural. It's just, it, it's what God intended it to be. It's that perfect expression. Notice the phrase, leaning on her, beloved. We see that repeated in verse 6, that same concept. When there's that intimacy, when there is that, there's a sense of security. And by the way, if there isn't that security, there won't be that intimacy. The two of them have to go together. Set me as a seal on your heart, as a seal on your forearm. It's like a band that you'd wear up here on this part of your arm. For love is as strong as death and jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. God has not only designed you so that certain things within you can only be satisfied by one person, He has designed you that there has to be that exclusive relationship between you and that person for those things to be fed, for those things to be opened up, for those things to be satisfied. God has made you monogamous. He's designed you to be that way. And it's a very, very dangerous thing to live in a society that treats sex like a favor that you can hand out to several people and then someday discover love. It is not. You need to have that one-on-one relationship that God has built a certain kind of godly jealousy within you. We'll talk about the sinful kind in a moment, but remember what the Bible says about our God. Our God is a jealous God and a consuming fire, just like down here. It says that you're consumed with that person and you need to know that you have that oneness, that intimacy that's only between the two of us. Nobody else is in on this. There's no one else that I have to think about. There's no one else that enters into this picture. You have to learn that faithfulness is not something that you work at. Faithfulness is not something that you hope for. Faithfulness is not something that just comes. Faithfulness needs to be the natural expectation and the natural outgrowth of your direction of your desires towards one person. There's a security that's there. That nothing else in the world is going to step in between the two of us. I don't want and I couldn't have this relationship with anybody else. I am a one-woman man. My wife is a one-man woman. You make yourself that way. You design yourself to be that way. Looking around at life hurts that deludes from that. How many children have to see parents who've broken up, divorced over unfaithfulness, remarried again, maybe divorced and remarried a second time. And they watch this pattern multiplied and then the doubts creep in like cracks in their conscience. Uh, Is it possible? A woman looks at her father doing that and says, can I trust my husband? Is trust even possible? We allow things to intrude into the home that mar our sexuality. We allow images. I'm very, very conscious of what my children have seen on TV or have seen in different places that I knew about or that I didn't know about. And you never get images out of your mind. They never leave. Bring this subject up because it needs to be at least addressed at some point. It's amazing the amount of child abuse that takes place within Christian homes. And it is amazing how complicit both the parents are in 
the abuse. One of the most public cases today of child abuse, we don't talk about it unless it involves some entertainment figure who have become our demigods to us, but the parents introduced their child into the home of the man who is a 45-year-old man who's accused of molesting a little child. And because he's a pop singer, it's controversial. The parents introduced that child into the home. And so much of what is abusive in a home is complicit by both partners allowing it to happen. One person knows about it and doesn't do anything about it, and the other person is involved in it in some way. And then that child gets warped. I bring this up to say you cannot bottle that. You cannot deny that. If you have been the victim, if you have been have experienced that, that will either be opened up and dealt with or it will warp you. That are, those are your only two choices. As a pastor, I couldn't believe the number of times that people sat in front of me for marital counseling. And then within a few minutes, the same signs, the same words, the same things, and in your heart, you got that sickened turning, your pit of your stomach turned to ice. You knew you were dealing with a case where one of those two had been abused as a child. Or one of those two had had abused pornography, which is the same thing. Both of them work in the same way. And you're just sick at heart because they're not talking about that. Neither one is talking about what's the cause. They're talking about problems they have between one another, the fact that they've lost the feeling, I've lost the love, I don't have the past. That's all they're talking about. But sick inside of you, deep inside of you, the pit of your stomach, you've seen it too many times. And you start to ask the questions and you start to open up and you start to talk to them and it starts to come out and you see that person who has been so affected by that sin, either of their own account or because of someone else, and they put layer after layer after layer to guard it. Like it's, it's like a little poison inside of them that's been surrounded by a shell because they don't want it to get to the rest of them. And yet it's still poisoning them. And you've got to open it up. You've got to deal with these matters. And it's just so sick. You cannot awaken passion in someone that has a cancer that's come in through the home. You can't. You've got to deal with that. And as young people, as you go out of here, you've got to realize that you're entering into relationships with people who don't know themselves often, much less you know them. If you haven't talked with them, if you haven't been completely open, if your engagement isn't about your marriage, if your engagement's about your wedding, that's the most dangerous thing that can happen to a young Christian couple. The engagement turns to be all about that one day, that one fantasy day that everybody has always dreamed of and what it could be. Then the wedding itself turns out to be how to impress each other's family or what everybody expects me to do. Your engagement ought to be gaining an emotional intimacy with that person where they're free to talk to you, where they're free to open up where they're free to deal with the problems that have crowded into their life. You know you've achieved intimacy when somebody can tell you anything. When you feel free to tell that person anything, you are completely accepted in them. And that's what you should go for. That's what you should put as your goal. That's the only thing that I want. And this kind of openness where they're talking this way to one another, that's not possible with people who've been jaded by the sinfulness of the world people who've been wounded and infected by some kind of sin in their past, that sin has to be purified, and it can be, through the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, it is possible. Not only possible, it's expected. The Holy Spirit came to deal with your sin, not just to coexist side by side with it. But you've got to deal with it and get it in the open. And there's this sense of security that's there with the couple that God wants to be. She's leaning on his arm and she totally trusts in him. But notice, because love is as strong as death and jealousy as cruel as the grave, its flames of fire are most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench this kind of love. You can't separate the second half of that verse from the first half. The Bible teaches that your desire for another person is total and complete. You want more that if it uses the metaphor here of water for sensual pleasure, you always want more. That's a good thing. You know, it's a good thing that it's not like wedding night, done, okay, what do we do next? Let's go buy a home. You know, it's a good thing that there's continuing desire that grows throughout your life. 
But please remember what Jesus told the woman at the well. He said, you drink of this water, you're going to want more. But I offer a water that satisfies you. Please remember that even the best, even the most godly, even the most wonderful of marriages is unsatisfying. You cannot meet the innermost needs of that person. You'll always want more of them. You'll never want to separate from them, even when God takes one of them home. You've got to remember when you marry that you don't know what you're saying. You're marrying somebody and you're saying for better or for worse. Do you have any idea what worse means? Some of you may have seen bad, but you've never seen worse. You don't know what it means to have to keep that vow through anything that person does. You don't know what it means to keep that vow as things happen in a relationship. You've no idea what you're promising to do. You can't keep those promises without Jesus Christ. You can't. And you've got to learn to say, listen, maybe I didn't grow up in this idyllic home. Maybe I didn't grow up in this home where there was an openness and my parents demonstrated what they should. They reproduced their healthy life in us as children. Maybe I didn't have that. I'd better strive to achieve it. Maybe now I'm not living in a relationship that's deeply satisfying to me. I'd better strive to achieve it. But you cannot achieve it apart from Jesus Christ. This book is not meant to stand on its own as if human pleasure and as if human fulfillment is something that's going to happen just down here in its own sphere apart from the activity and the work of God. There's got to be a godliness underneath all of it. And so I understand why preachers want to end this book and put a focus back on our relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible says, if you cannot love the one you see, how can you claim to love the one you haven't seen? So if you cannot express proper biblical desire for a woman that you're looking at, how can you possibly understand what godly desire is for Jesus Christ whom your eyes have never seen? There's an interrelationship between our human relationships and our divine relationship with the Father. And this book ends with that. Notice her speaking as again in verse 10. I became in his eyes as one who found peace. Her doubts, her troubled, her torn, back and forth attitude was gone because she found a lover who was able to bring out of her that which was best. She was in a culture that enabled her, in her home I'm talking about, that enabled her to express who and what she was and what God made her to be. That's what you want. And if you don't know how to achieve it, I don't care if you can parse a Hebrew verb. I don't care if you know how to witness to a person. I don't care if you know all of your history or all of your science. If you don't know what the Bible teaches about the most basic of human relationships, how to get there and how to keep it, you will never be a witness for Jesus Christ and you will never be stable in the ministry. The only stable ministries are based on stable homes. And you've got to look at this Bible and learn to use it and to say, what was this passage intended for? It was intended to build genuine godly desire in me so that it could be expressed in a godly way towards the right person in the right time for God's right purpose. I actually encourage you to use this in your youth group. This is not a book that will do anything else but build godliness in young people. The Bible builds righteousness. It doesn't stir up ungodly passions. But I encourage you to study this. I encourage you to use it in your marital counseling. This is that kind of book. And you've got to bring it all together. I just feel so inadequate in three messages to even try to do it. But I just want to leave you with this. It's the Word of God that purifies. It's the Word of God that does its work. It was the Word of God that regenerated you. This is part of that Word of God. This book will do its work in your life as you study it. You don't have to read every how-to book by every self-appointed guru on marriage. You may have come from homes that did such damage to you. Read this book. Read the Word of God. Pour over it. And let the Word of God sink deep into your soul. Let it change your consciousness. It's the only thing that's effective in changing your life, the Word of God in prayer. Let's pray. Oh, Father, You know my heart. 
you know those areas in my life that you've blessed me. You know what a I'm, I'm a testimony to what it means to have someone love me in such a way that has changed my life. Someone love me in such a way that sets me free from so much foolishness that would be there, from so many things. And I praise you for that, and I'll praise you forever for what you've given to me in this life. But I'd ask that in my life and in the life of every person in this room, that our heart's desire might be to dwell eternally with you, that all of our relationships and that everything we experience and every appetite that we have in this world would lead us to want more from you and to long for the next. I pray that whatever the sin is that might be haunting lives, whatever the sickness is that might have invaded people's hearts or invaded homes or invaded the, the upbringing of young people here today, that it might be dealt with and that we might be open about it, that you might allow us to have what you've blessed us with in this life, those things that draw us closer to you. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.